Hi, everyone, and welcome to At Katie Couric. The Atlantic recently featured an article called The End of Men that caught my attention. I even tweeted the link. It stated that this year, for the first time, women became the majority of the U.S. workforce, and most managers are now women. And for every two men who received a college degree, three women did the same thing. And according to the article, many moms-to-be would rather have a pink nursery than a blue one. So have we come a long way, or are there still big obstacles on the road to equality? Joining me today are two women with a lot of expertise in the area. Gloria Steinem is a writer and journalist who is the godmother of the modern women's movement. And Jamu Green is president of the Women's Media Center and former head of Rock the Vote. As always, I'd like to say a quick thank you to the sponsor of our web show, Dove. Nice to see you both. Great to see you. And we have so much to talk about. Yes. First of all, let's talk about this article because I know that it's something that mm -hmm. you both read as well. And you had a problem with the title. It's it was called The End of Men. And that bugged you. Yes, it's a stupid <laughs> title because the idea is that somebody has to win. They can't even imagine equality. So the lack of ability to imagine equality and cooperation instead of domination it is certainly a big problem in getting there. But and don't you think maybe, Gloria, the, the title was a bit misleading? The article was really sort of how women are suddenly, and this is something we'll have to discuss too, because there are a lot of things that contradict the very thesis of this piece, but that women are suddenly coming up in a way and are making themselves known in a variety of fields, in a variety of areas that heretofore they have not. I mean, that's sort of what I took away from the article. I think maybe, can mm -hmm. you believe they were trying to market the article and capture a lot of attention? Why would a magazine no. do that? <laughs> well, uh, it's possible that the writer didn't like the title either because yes. I agree with you that it was different from, from the article. Uh, but the idea that women are almost now the majority of workers in the labor force is a marker, it's true, but it doesn't tell us that they're still earning 25% less and they're still much likely to, less likely to get promoted. Um, <clears throat> and, you know, actually it's a big motive for men to work for equal pay for women so that men are not the higher paid ones who get fired first. Oh, I see, and the man session, as they call it. What did you think of the article? I, I think that you know some of the questions she poses are harmful as well. You know, to start off by saying, uh, you know, what if equality is not the end goal? Equality has always been the end goal, and I do think that she dismissed a lot of the issues that we're still facing, as Gloria mentioned, uh, to casually uh, pass on the fact that men are still clearly in control in many of the upper echelons of society. It was a, it was a really brief phrase, and then she went on to uh, continue to point to a number of the advances we've made, which clearly need to be celebrated. Clearly, we owe a lot to the work that has been done uh, for decades. and. I, I think, though, we still have to look at in the media, though we've had great success with um, your show and with Diane Sawyer and a lot of women who have uh, made it uh, in very successful ways in front of the camera, 3% of the decision-making positions in the media, the clout positions, are still held by women, where 97% of the decisions are made by men. But there's a lot of work to be done. You know, in fact, I think what was confusing for me when I read the article, I thought, well, this is a lot to celebrate. And then I uh, would read sort of other pieces, and Anna Quinlan came and gave a speech in Charlottesville uh, for a luncheon in honor of my sister Emily, who passed away, mm -hmm. that's a scholarship fund for girls in Charlottesville. And, and she brought up some very um, antithetical points to the piece. But... Before we mention those, can I just talk about mm. some of the good news real quick before we totally become Buzz Killington, as my daughter says? <laughs> all right, women are 60% of all college graduates. Women are 68% of all master degree holders. They have more PhDs, and almost 42% of those with MBAs are now women. Um, so there are some good things. As we mentioned, they are the majority in the workforce, but let's talk about some things that are not so good. because. Well, but even that is not so, I mean, it, it's great that, that women are 
educated. I couldn't agree more because it gives you pleasure in your life. <clears throat> but part of the reason that women need a BA degree or a college degree is that even with one, they make less than a man with a high school education because they can't become plumbers and electricians or they're less likely to get into the trades that pay a lot even without a college education. Which is an interesting point. But let, let's talk about some of the negative things and, and why these sort of statistics still exist. Now, the, this is according to the White House Project, which I'm sure you all are familiar with. Women account for only 18% of our top leaders in all fields. In politics, uh, Anna mentioned this in her speech, in female representation, the U.S. has dropped to the 69th spot behind Iraq and North Korea, <laughs> which I found so shocking. In 1993, women were 12% of partners in law firms. Today, it's a whopping 18%. Only 17% of Congress is made up of women. Women make 78.7 cents for every dollar a man makes. Um, and women earn more college degrees, as I mentioned, but hold, hold only 16% of leadership roles in the business world, 23% in academia, and 22% in journalism, and of course the number that you mentioned are decision-making, I guess management jobs. So why these depressing statistics? What's behind this mm -hmm. and why haven't we come further if so many strides have been made? Well, you know, patriarchy is behind this and racism is behind this. These are really old systems, so it takes uh, quite a while. I mean, we had a suffragist and an abolitionist movement that gained a legal identity as human beings for women of all races and men of color. That took a, more than 100 years. Now we're striving for legal and social equality. That's gonna take 100 years, probably. We're only 30 years into it. You know, this is, this is a long process, <clears throat> and we've come an, you know, an incredible distance, which we need to celebrate, but Really, the problem mainly is our idea of our soundbite minds, you know, that we think it's going to happen right away. We have to do as much as we can every day and push the boundaries, but we also have to plan for our daughters and our grandsons who are also going to be feminists, and, you know, we have to look forward. What do you think are the major factors, if you had to pinpoint sort of actual things in addition to social and cultural movements taking a long time to have an impact. Are there specific things that are keeping women from, you know, progressing more in the workplace? Well, I, I think we have to point to the media. Again, it surrounds us, it tells our stories. When you look at G-rated movies having the you know, same amount of sexualized images of girls and women as R-rated films do, uh, that clearly has an impact. When you look at the speaking roles in uh, all animated films, that one out of three are going to be uh, girls or women. And I think if you look at just the acceptance of sexism in the media, and especially with our female candidates, the levels of attacks and how it is accepted, which is completely contrary to if something is said that is deemed as being racist. Uh, I, I think I'm actually quoting you when I say, sexism needs to become as repugnant as racism, and we are far from that place um, today because the outrage isn't there. We saw in the 2008 presidential campaign the, the level of attack that uh, Senator Clinton came under, and uh, without as much response, um, and for, I think, the community to stop and say, this is unacceptable, whether it was products that are being sold or statements that are set on air, we, we do have a long ways to go to uh, raise the level of outrage around sexism. So do you still think little girls are programmed to be subservient, submissive in popular culture in terms of the images that they, that confront them from a very, very early age? I mean, I think, you know, because I'm very cognizant of this, having two daughters, you know, and being a strong, proactive feminist and proud of it. So I'm very conscious of that. But I also see films like Mulan that celebrate sort of a, a, a really strong woman. Um, and I, I try to see other things in mass media that, that counter, you know, that, that counter some of these images that we've been seeing all our lives as somebody who's 53 and grew up kind of 
in that culture. So do, do you see things changing for the better in some ways? I, I think that they are, we're making incremental changes and that's what is uh, so, in a sense, laughable about the, the title of uh, the piece, The End of Men. We uh, are so far away from that and I mean clearly that and is not. And we don't not, want that, we by don't the want way. That to Let's happen. state that no. loud and clear. Um, and that has never been the goal uh, of a feminist, but we, we absolutely have uh, large steps that still need to be made. And a lot of this, I think, can, again, be pointed back to the media and the role that they play. Uh, we, we have Dora, which is a great, uh, a great example to point to, but the majority of the images, the majority of the speaking characters, the majority of the positions of authority, uh, an overwhelming majority mm -hmm. are going to be men and boys. But, you know, I see that's so Raven, and she's smart and, mm. you know, no, has a lot of moxie. And, isolated I mean, there, examples. There's, right. there's progress, but I think we are mostly measuring progress by whether or not women are, women are doing what men used to do. We mm -hmm. need to also measure progress by men being nurturing parents and being truly parents uh, because, you know, women cannot do two full-time jobs, and that is, um, you know, the problem of most women in this country probably right now that they're working outside the home and inside the home too and <clears throat> men are missing uh, being nurturing parents there are all kinds of wonderful studies that show that men live longer uh, have fewer illnesses less depression uh, better sex lives, all kinds of things if they are egalitarian parents. Well, I did read something this weekend in the Washington Post that I found very heartening. It was about a shift in the role of fathers. It was really a profile of a single father who adopted two African-American boys, a white man in Washington, D.C., a single guy. But it went on to say that according to the Labor Department, for every hour and a half a mother spends caring, doing the child caring responsibilities or having those responsibilities, mm -hmm. men are now spending 49 minutes. Now, I thought that was actually a, a, a wonderful mm -hmm. advance in terms of sharing the responsibility of raising children. Do you see it, it that trend? Advance. I mean, they're, they're doing more than their fathers, uh, but they're still not doing anything like as much as women are doing. So it's on the way, but it's not there yet. But this is, I think, deeply connected to our political life, too because most of us, women and men, are raised almost entirely by women, we associate female authority with childhood. And we think it's appropriate to childhood and not to uh, adult life and politics. Because <clears throat> we really haven't seen it that much, right? So some people, and I think especially men, as we saw in this last election, men on camera, <laughs> felt regressed when they saw Hillary Clinton, a powerful woman, because the last time they saw a powerful woman, they were eight. <laughs> you know, so the, men raising children is crucial in every area because it shapes our, our idea, you know, that men can be nurturing, women can be knowledgeable and authoritative. We both can be both. Do you think that, that part of it, one of the reasons that that sort of a patriarchal society is perpetuated is, that's a lot of P words, is mm -hmm. that, that white males in positions of power and authority generally, this is Anna Quinlan's theory because we talked about this a lot, generally hire people who look like them? Well, and that's, that's part of the problem? That's, that's part of it, but I, I think that's uh, the outcropping of something that goes very deep, which is that women got in this jam in the first place, all of us, wherever we come from, because we are the means of reproduction. Our bodies are the means of reproduction. And it's the desire to control the process of, of reproduction which is made even more strong if there is a racial caste system because then you want to maintain racial quote-unquote purity you know and restrict the movements of the women of the powerful group and create and get the women of color to create more and more cheap labor I mean you know it really is the politics of reproduction at, at the, the root of it and that is you know increased by what you describe which is the idea that uh, we are not all human beings and we can somehow only relate to people who look like us. And I think we can point to the health care reform process we just went through as a very clear example of how much work there is to be done. When 
you know, absolutely there are some you know, really good things in the bill that should be celebrated and will allow for greater access for health care for many women. But we just went through the greatest rollback in reproductive rights in my generation. I, I was born the same year that Roe v. Wade uh, was, uh, you know, affirmed. And 1971? 1972. 72. You're and, young. Um, <laughs> I'm getting there. I'm getting there. It's my birthday today. Oh, happy birthday. Thank you. Um, but you know, going through the health care reform process, women and our reproductive rights were what was targeted at that last minute hour uh, behind closed doors when the Catholic bishops cut a deal with uh, Nancy Pelosi. And uh, it was clear that some of those same types of attacks on different issues and, and the priorities of different constituencies were things that uh, were not agreed upon. Mm -hmm. But when it came to which constituency was going to, I think, be, be hit the most, um, we, we did just take a real, yeah, real even big though, Even though the majority of Catholics in public opinion polls didn't agree with what the bishops were asking for. That no federal and even funds though the nuns be used. Came for, yeah, even though nuns came for. So, you was know, that it, just it, an extension, though, of the Hyde Amendment, which basically said no, no federal funds could be used. No, it was it was it went further than than the Hyde Amendment, and the Hyde Amendment should be repealed. I mean, it, it you know it, it was challenged in the Supreme Court, and if there had been more women at the time on the court, we wouldn't have ha had the Hyde Amendment because it penalizes poor women terribly. Right. Um, but you know, I think we need to understand if we get the politics of reproduction we're not so mystified by what happens. For instance, sometimes on campus, um, students will say to me, well, why are these right-wing groups both against contraception and lesbians? <laughs> you know, which they find bizarre. And I say, but, you know, it's not bizarre. It's rational because they're against any form of sexual expression that doesn't end in conception or that can't end in conception. So those are the same, those are condemned by the, by the same groups, even though it might seem irrational. Since we're on the, the subject of reproductive rights, can you be a conservative feminist? Sarah Palin recently, I think, rankled some traditional feminists by calling herself a feminist. And despite the fact she doesn't espouse many traditional feminist uh, points of view, well, I mean, we're free to call ourselves whatever we wish, um, but um, I think her calling herself a feminist has mostly to do with how many votes Hillary Clinton got in the, the presidential race because, yes, you can be a feminist who doesn't in, uh, agree with abortion, would never have an abortion, but you can't be a feminist who says that other women can't and criminalizes abortion. One in three American women needs an abortion at some time in her life to make that criminal and dangerous is not a feminist act, and that is the position of Sarah Palin. Do you and agree I, with that? I, I think that most feminists uh, do not make their voting decisions based on our reproductive organs. It is about the issues, and uh, are you, you know, promoting the sentiment, the values, and our rights that are clearly important. And um, I, I would say that Sarah Palin uh, does not represent many uh, of those same sentiments. In what way? I mean, why? Well, clearly she wants the government to intervene uh, in family planning decisions and to uh, have the government come into uh, my home or your home and make medical decisions for us. And uh, that, to me, is, uh, goes absolutely against any feminist principle I, I grew up learning. So both of you would say you cannot be against abortion morally yeah. for, for an entire population or yeah, for an entire country for, and, be, be, considered yourself, a of and be considered a feminist. And, it, and in fact, the, the women's movement has gone to the same lengths to keep women who did, from being pressured into a, abortion uh, as we have to try to keep it safe and legal. So it is about that, that particular freedom of choice. But, you know, she can, she can call herself anything she wishes. She can't say that Susan B. Anthony, however, was against abortion, which is what they say. There's absolutely no evidence of any statement that Susan B. Anthony ever made against abortion, and they just are not telling the truth about this. But there are other female candidates. You know, it was interesting to see everyone herald this most recent round of primaries as the year of the woman. And um, they're certainly talking about women of a variety of political ideologies. Do you applaud these women who have 
progressed on, uh, you know, uh, or climbed the political ladder, even if their views, like Carly Fiorina, for example, um, I'm not sure how would, Meg would, Whitman feels about reproductive well, rights. Well, but they, I mean, you know, Carly's position on tax, taxation would deprive women of child care and so on and so on. So, but I mean, they're free to, I defend their right to be wrong, right? <laughs> but they have an absolute right to be wrong. But the reason that they are being put forward is that the women's movement has been so successful. So there are some people that when they're on your side, you know you're winning. And I would say, you know, that that's what's happening here. They saw how well Hillary Clinton, the Republican Party, saw how well Hillary Clinton did and is now fielding female candidates. But the good news is that this is an electoral po process and people are smart and they can look at the issues and understand uh, you know, it's it's much more difficult when it's an appointment, like with Justice Thomas, you know, who also was put forward because of the civil rights movement, even though he didn't represent it on most of the issues, but he could be appointed. Uh, this time, you know, with an electoral process, we get to look and see what the issues are. And just as, as more men than women supported Sarah Palin the last time, I suspect it may happen again. And I think, I think it's great to actually celebrate a time as we're getting closer to a time where it will be unremarkable for two women to be running against each other, for women to be in all of the presidential debates. I think we've taken some very significant steps in uh, the last cycles to make sure that it is unremarkable. Now, um, how, again, those issues play out in for those candidates, I think, is what is going to determine if they're successful or not. And we've seen so many years of the woman, uh, as they've been called in 1984. It was a year of the woman. In 1992. 1992. But in 1984, uh, many women won in primaries and then lost in the general election cycle. And I think that that is because when voters go into that polling booth, when women go in to, to cast those votes, they're not voting on, again, reproductive organs. They're voting on where you stand on our rights, the same set of you know, feminist sentiments, and you know, are you for pro-equality, as Gloria mm -hmm. says. And I, I think that that will be a challenge for many of the conservative women who are trying to mm -hmm. uh, tap into the success of um, Secretary Clinton. We need feminist Clinton. men, and we do have feminist men. You know, one but there are a lot of women who like like conservative women. It's not as yes. if people who are going to vote are only going to vote no, for right. liberal candidates. There are many women out there who who relate to and appreciate and applaud the politics of someone like but, Carly Fiorina or Sarah but Palin it's not just or a variety about, of other it's Republican women. It's not about biology. Women. It's about, no, no, no. I'm, yeah. I'm not saying No, I know, but I mean, I mean those, those, those women, if they have access to information about the issues, uh, and where these women stand, which is against, squarely against what most women need and want and say they need and want in majority public opinion polls. So, you know, the, if, if, if they still vote for them, they're voting against themselves, which is quite tragic to me. On the other hand, I read recently a Gallup poll showed 48% of women identify themselves as pro-life, 45% as pro-choice. But this, but this is because of the terms, you, you know, pro-life, pro what does that mean? I mean, there are, we all wear buttons that say a woman's life is a human life, you know. So, you know, if, if, you, if you ask the question the way it should be asked without those confusing terms, which are quite backward, uh, which is who makes the decision, a woman and her physician or the government, the huge majority, over 60 percent, say it should be the woman and her physici physician, not the government. And that's the point. They don't want women, they don't want the government coming into our homes and telling us how we should uh, make a medical decision. I think, again, it is a branding, marketing issue that has been uh, won in many ways by the pro-life uh, movement. but it. it does go deeper into the issue, I think that's when you see those shifts in the support for pro-choice candidates. At some point, just getting back to those candidates, um, you know, it bothered me when everyone said, you're the woman, because I mm -hmm. thought, w isn't true equality viewing them from a prism that evaluates their ideology, their positions, how they feel about certain issues, the fact that they're male or female, of course, 
it, it, it shapes who we are as individuals, but shouldn't it really be secondary to what they would do in positions of power and what their philosophies are? Yes, of course. I mean, in, in real life, <laughs> they're, they're, you know, race is a fiction that, ha that, I mean, we all came from the same place in Africa and we just got adapted to climate wherever we went. So race is a fiction. Gender is a fiction, you know. So we're trying to get to the point of shared humanity, absolutely. That's the whole idea. So it's just as important to me, and I have, uh, you know, worked for um, male candidates who really were feminists and against female candidates who were not. Let me ask you, a, a, somebody who asked a question on Facebook, because we solicited those, because we're trying to be very, you know, modern here. Jacqueline uh, Koch says on Facebook, do you think that feminism is still considered a bad word today? I think the term used to really get a bad rap, but today it seems things are beginning to level out. Well, what I mean, obvi you? obviously, Sarah Palin calling herself, a, it's interesting to me because is Rush Limbaugh going to call her a feminazi like he calls me, you know, what? <laughs> obviously, feminism is winning, otherwise these women wouldn't be calling themselves feminists. So the truth of the matter is that in public opinion polls, more women consider themselves feminists than consider themselves Republicans, evangelicals, or even Democrats. I thought it was worth just saying, reminding people what the definition of feminism is, because when I look yes, at feminists, thank you, it right. says a person <laughs> whose beliefs and behaviors are based on feminism. So mm -hmm. looking at feminism, the doctrine advocating social, political, and all other rights of women equal to those of men. Mm -hmm. Hard to argue with that, yeah, isn't it? But it's been demonized, you know, by the Rush Limbaugh's of the world who say feminazi and so on. So if people go to the dictionary and see what it means, then I think, you know, most folks agree, men too. Having and said I think that, if you though, look I'm sorry. at the millennial generation and what is so inspiring about, you know, the younger generations that are coming up is they are the most diverse. They are the most tolerant generation this country has ever seen. And a lot of these issues around, uh, you know, putting feminism in a silo in the way that Rush has tried and other folks have tried are, are going to be pushed back from these younger uh, generations. At the same time, don't you sort of feel like feminism, the movement, has lost a bit of steam? That, you know, I know that I, di I didn't find the statistics, but of course you all, more than mm -hmm. anyone, are familiar with young women of a certain age basically is shooing the whole notion mm. but of the, feminism and, and and not considering themselves feminists. Well, they're more, I mean, the if you say women's movement, I agree that, that, that the word feminist has been demonized even though it has, you know, a huge number, you know, of adherents, you know. But uh, if you say women's movement, uh, it's it's oh it's 90 percent of young women versus about 70 percent of older women who say that they support it so it's actually more younger women than older women and that is the power of social media if you spend any time on twitter or, or on facebook the to see the level of connect uh, connections that are happening and the organizing that's happening and just the medium in and of itself um, is very attractive to women and I think allows us to, in this changing media landscape, climate, to really use social media as a way of continuing to rebuild or continue to build the movement and that's where I think you're getting those numbers as far as 90% younger women who will engage and call themselves a part of the women's community. So, women's so you think it's a, it's, it's a misconception mm. that many young people don't consider yeah, themselves feminists? Yeah, I think it's, it's part of the idea that the movement is over. You know, I mean, first, the opposition first takes the form of you can't do that, it's against biology, God, Freud, something, you can't do that, right? Uh, it's not necessary, it's impossible. And then the second form of opposition is, well, it used to be necessary, but it's not anymore. And we're in that stage, so I think the, uh, you know, actually I think young women should sue for libel, you know, because they are so distorted in their real views, you know, by this idea that they're, they're you know, they don't support their own equality. Um, so you don't think there's any merit to the argument that sort of feminism is out of step with modern American women? No. No, because I travel all the time, so I'm preserved from that. I mean, I'm on the road most of the time. Because I think you right. hear that argument increingly, as you know. I think it's really been around and circulating for the last five but to ten years. You know, Time magazine, I think, has declared the women's movement feminism dead 27 times. 
<laughs> you know, so this is declaring us dead is part of the opposition. But actually, it keeps growing and growing and growing, you know, in, in real terms. Jimu, there's a, a Twitter question that has to do with sort of the sexualization of women. Um, actually, I wanted to ask you, because we're almost out of time, but, you know, I get bothered uh, by sort of how women are increasingly, and maybe it's my imagination, maybe it's because I'm getting older and I have two daughters, but the objectification of women seems to be so in your face mm. these days, whether it's with artists, rap stars, um, you know, that's kind of a, a, a tired argument, but it's still very prevalent in pop culture. And even in the way women are presenting themselves, um, it seems to be, um, you know, they'd rather be viewed as hot than accomplished. And mm. is there any, any any method to my madness here? And do you sense that in popular culture as well? I think clearly there is a, a huge problem with the sexualization of girls and women in the media. And we talked a, a little bit about the you know, images that are you know, funneled into girls from very young ages and G movies, G rated movies. I think that though when you, when you ask the questions to especially high school students, which is something we've been doing at the Women's Media Center, there is uh, an ability uh, from a media literacy standpoint that many of these young women have to where they are starting to separate those images um, from their reality. And, and I think social media is contributing to that media literacy. I think uh, a lot of the conversations that are going on right now with high school girls are pushing back against those sexualized images. And, and that is a, a real opportunity for growth within the women's movement to, to push back against those images. But, but at the end just, of the day, it's not being yeah. generated by young women. It's not being, it, it's not but even necessarily being generated like, I look by, at Sarah McLaughlin, you know, who I- it is, more power to them. You know, yeah. I mean, because, you know, feeling one's being proud, being body proud, having, uh, control or feeling power in, in sexuality, there's nothing wrong with it. I mean, in a generalized way, the cultures that require women and girls to cover up their bodies are worse for women than those who, in which women can uncover their bodies. So I think, you know, some of it may be age because for me, say, I grew up in a time in which to be uh, overtly sexual was dangerous mm -hmm. <laughs> because you've got to be the wrong kind of, you know, then anything could happen to you. Um, so we may fear for young girls who are actually expressing their sexuality and have a right to. But I do think that if you look at rap music in particular, that there are decisions being made in uh, small executive offices by mostly white men about the images that they want to see their artists producing and uh, especially how uh, they show portray African American young women is problematic, but again, I don't think that is uh, being driven by the artists or driven by the community. Uh, in many ways, that's driven from a, a purely profit-centered um, uh, reality uh, of these executives, and that is where we're seeing a lot of young women uh, finally finding their voice and pushing back against those images. But at the same time, I mean, I do think there is that age-old adage that sex sells and that looks matter in our culture. It's a visual medium, our, our, you know. And I was thinking about Sarah McLaughlin, who, you know, I, I love as a singer and I still like her. It's not, I'm holding this against her, but I noticed she sort of transformed her image to be more in keeping with what a modern pop star mm -hmm. should look like. Well, especially in the music world, because now singers are so young, you know, I mean, I mean, like if you're 22 and you're trying to enter the field, you're considered old. So uh, the question, I think, is whether she did this out of her own free will or whether she forced into it. Yeah, was forced whether someone it. said, hey, if you yeah, want to be more think, marketable, you need to set right. yourself and, up and a little. And that's really the question, and it's not always easy to figure out, but it's very important that we tune into ourselves and find the inner authority to say, what is I really want, and then do it. I mean, I must say there's one advantage of being a member of the wrong group, which we all are here, <laughs> which is that nothing you do is exactly right. This frees you to do whatever you want, <laughs> because you really come to the conclusion that there is no right way for a wrong group, if you know what I mean. 
and therefore for us to to be to have some kind of self authority uh, why not you know why not okay. We, we had a, a Twitter question that was sort of along these lines. Bobby, Bobby Rivers TV tweets, I feel that shows like The Bachelorette are a whoopee cushion on the seat of the feminist movement. <laughs> what? Why say that again? I feel like shows like The Bachelorette are a whoopee cushion oh. on the seat of the feminist movement. <laughs> Gloria's opinion on that? It's, it, you know, the shows are incredibly stupid, but what, what, is, <laughs> what is most offensive about them is it's not equal opportunity stupidity, you know. So it's not... Well, they have The Bachelor, too. No, and... I know, but it's not. But there are m many more women competing for the handsome, rich guy than there are men competing for a woman on these shows. So is that it, true? It's I don't the, know. I the mean, numbers? I, mean, yeah. I don't watch either of them. By I'm, far. By uh, far. So, I mean, I have a kind of motto, which is, you probably can't say it on... <laughs> Anyway. Oh, go ahead. We're, it's a web show, Gloria. Go for it. <laughs> yeah. Unless it's super, super risque. Which is, which is that, well, it starts with S. As a, all right. It's always is better if it's equally divided. It's still a problem, but if it's equally divided, it's at least not a political problem. All right. You're going to have to explain that to me later. Um, but, you know, I can't believe, Gloria, you're 76 years old. Yes, I can't I'm, believe it either. First of all, you know, who knew? <laughs> but, you know, as you look back on your goals for the feminist movement, on what you really wanted for girls and women in this country, you know, do you feel now that, wow, we, I mean, how do you feel about where we are today? Well, I, because I travel all the time, or much of the time, I have the opportunity to see how far along we are, you know, and to hear uh, women and men too, telling me their stories and how much their lives have changed, and so I'm just constantly nourished by that. I I do think that I and many of us underestimated the the force of the opposition. I mean, I kind of thought growing up we had a democracy, and if we got a majority support for issues, we would win the issues, which turns out not to be the case because we've had a majority support for issues for a long time, and we don't have them you know, embedded in our, in our government. So, um, you know, I, sometimes people ask me, you know, what, what are you most proud of in your life? And I always say I haven't done it yet. <laughs> I mean, I'm living in the future, actually. So, you know, I, I'm, I'm encouraged by Jammu. I'm encouraged by you. You will be here. You will be here when I'm not. And that feels good. What are you most disappointed about? Well, I, th I think that we have not made a real dent, uh, as you see in that article's title, you know, The End of Men, in the idea of that somebody has to win, you know, that, I mean, we're still living in an either-or culture, not in an and culture. We're still ranking instead of linking. We still have a sort of hierarchical view of life instead of a circle. And actually, for most of human history, we've lived the other way. It's been about ranking. Not, it's been about linking, not about we've, the circle was the paradigm of society. We can get to it, but I'm most disappointed that it's not part of discussion. That, for instance, the media still views objectivity as being even-handedly negative and doesn't really report that much on solutions, and especially does reports on things that are equally, that are divided. I noticed that in Japan, they discuss uh, important issues with at least three people, you know, and that's like a drink of water in the desert, you know, to think there are three different views instead of only two fighting with each other. And there should be, and in the case of most issues, there are seven sides or 14 sides or, you know, and I'm disappointed that we don't have the imagination of cooperation, equality, community, that we're still in this old paradigm. Do you think that's because the nascent uh, feminist movement was in some ways based on anger, outrage, uh, and, and the desire to help women progress that was threatening, so threatening to the status quo that it, it, that it almost positioned the sides against each other instead of a more conciliatory mm -hmm. movement. I mean, is that just the way no, movements we, are born? If you asked me what we did wrong, I would say we were much too nice. Really? Yeah, because that we were trained to be nice and plump pillows and say, you know, we've been much too nice. 
And the, the idea of our being threatening doesn't come from our being threatening. It comes from the idea that a normal male-female relationship is 70-30 or 60-40, so 50-50 feels threatening. We've always been talking about 50-50. I think, though, what inspires me and, and gets me up every morning is the fact that to understand that there are more people, young women, men, who identify as feminists today than did back in 1970. And, and that in and of itself shows that we are continuing in the right direction. And also the fact that this next generation, they actually, I feel, see it as an and proposition versus the either or. Mm -hmm. and, and that's what, it, those are the you know future leaders. Those are the uh, future heads of uh, corporations. Those are the future media uh, experts. And, and, and that's what I think we can all look forward to is that we do have an opportunity to move away from the combative style to showing that it is all about pro-equality and it's not about one side winning over the other. Well, it's, I could talk to you guys for another hour, but we could I, talk to you. <laughs> <laughs> unfortunately, uh, we're not really out of time, but you all have to go and I have to go as well. But Gloria Steinem, it's always wonderful to talk to you. And Jamu Green, thank you so much for coming in. It was fun having you, you part of our discussion and maybe we continue, continue it in the hallway because I want to ask okay. you all a few other <laughs> things. And thanks to all of you for tweeting in your questions. And remember, you can follow me on Twitter if you dare. My handle is at Kitty Couric. And now stay tuned for a message from our sponsor, Dove.